Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening. Tonight, we're going to be talking about how language changes. We're going to talk about the growth of languages. We're going to talk about how language declines. But we're going to start with how language moves, the diffusion of language. And so throughout history, war and conquest, colonialism and imperialism, trade, and then more recently, the effects of globalization and modern instant communication have made it easier than ever for language to diffuse around the world. Now, over the next few slides, we're going to look at some examples of how that has happened, both historically and nowadays. And so we'll start with a historical example with regards to technology. Because in the late Middle Ages, the invention of the Gutenberg printing press and the rise of nation states worked to spread literacy and stabilize certain languages through widely distributed written forms. Johannes Gutenberg perfected the printing press by inventing the movable type printing press, which became known as the Gutenberg press. The subsequent Gutenberg Bible helped to support the Latin language, which it was printed in, whereas the Luther Bible did that for German, and the King James Bible did that for English. Now you add to that the rise of nation states, which had a strong interest in promoting a common culture, often by promoting a common language. Now in addition to that, we could also talk about trade. And this one's kind of interesting because Mandarin Chinese, even though it is the most commonly spoken first language in the world, has not widely diffused from its hearth. While China was very powerful and had trade with Asia and Oceania, they never really established colonies outside of Asia. And thus, Chinese speakers have always been concentrated in and around China. Now, with regards to diffusion, conquest, and colonialism, the major globalized languages of the world, like English, French, Spanish, and Arabic, spread from their hearths largely because of conquest and colonialism. Take Indo-European, for example. On the map above, that is the green arrows and bubbles. That diffused to Europe either through conquest or the diffusion of agricultural technology. Geographers still debate which one. But colonialism transplanted Indo-European languages to the Americas, Africa, and Australia. Now, on the map above, you can see the Afroasiatic language family in red, and that diffused, and more specifically, the language of Arabic, it spread with the diffusion of Islam. For our next example, let's take a look at this map. Now, before we get started with that, let's ask the question, what type of map are we looking at here? And hopefully you notice that yes, there are dots, yes, there are circles, but those circles vary in size because it is a proportional symbol or graduated symbol map. And this looks at the distribution of French language around the world. And you'll notice that it mirrors the areas that were French colonies, okay? French West Africa, Canada, and a number of its other colonies from around the world. All right, let's take a look at another example, and we'll start again with what type of map are we looking at, and at what scale are we examining this? And we're not going to be fooled by this one because it is a proportional symbol, graduated symbol map, just like the last one, and this is at the national scale, the country scale. And this is looking at the distribution of Portuguese around the world, and it follows the same kind of pattern that we saw with French, it's spoken in, yes, the home country, Portugal, but it's also spoken in a lot of the former colonies, like Brazil and Mozambique, to name a couple. Now, what's kind of interesting is a couple years ago, there are two major dialects of Portuguese. There's European Portuguese, which is what's spoken in Portugal, and there is Brazilian Portuguese. Those are the two major dialects. And when they tried to standardize the language a few years ago, because isolation creates differences and things like that. When they tried to standardize it, there was a strong push for Brazilian Portuguese to be the dominant written form of Portuguese because so many more people speak Brazilian Portuguese. Kind of an interesting effect of colonialism. Now, back to colonialism, 
and with regards to sub-Saharan Africa, less than 10% of the population of sub-Saharan Africa lives in a country where any indigenous African language is given official status. Now, as far as isolation goes, distance and isolation often allows cultural traits to diverge, which often results in the change in language. We'll use as an example the mountains of the Caucasus region, which tend to isolate the inhabitants of one valley from those in an adjacent one, which discourages contact that might lead to linguistic diffusion. But the rugged, hostile, or isolated environments can often protect linguistic groups that might otherwise be eclipsed by more dominant languages. So in short, isolation can serve to diverge languages from one another, but it can also protect those languages from being overcome by more dominant global languages. Shifting gears a little bit, we have some vocabulary that we need to introduce. Our first definition is monolingualism. The key there is the prefix mono, a society or country's use of only one language for all purposes of communication. As far as monolingual states go, there is Japan in Asia, Uruguay in South America. In Europe, you've got Iceland, Denmark, Portugal, Poland, and Lesotho in South Africa. But even that isn't universal because, for example, in Japan, there's more than half a million people who still speak Korean. In Japan. Then we have bilingualism. Bilingualism, the prefix bi, describing a society's use of two official languages. Canada is officially bilingual, which is a reflection of the colonial division within the country between France and Great Britain. Another example is Finland. Finland is bilingual. And then we have multilingualism, the common use of two or more that's the key part, or more. If it's just two, it's going to be bilingual. If it's more, that's going to be when you have multilingual status. Um, Bolivia has three official languages, but then in 2009, changed it in their constitution and declared that Spanish, along with all indigenous languages, were going to be given official status. And there's 36 indigenous languages that are spoken in Bolivia. And in multilingual India, the country's official languages generally correspond with the country's subnational entities, which they call states, just like the U.S. But English was the language that was imposed by the British colonial rulers, but it was retained after independence as the country's language of business, government, and education. And this provides some linguistic unity for India, which has somewhere around 800 different indigenous languages and dialects. And this is why today many of India's over 1 billion people speak English well enough to provide customer service over the telephone for clients in the United States. Now, speaking of subnational influences on language, we mentioned in a previous lecture that now 31 U.S. states have declared English to be the official language of their state. Some, though, have what are known as English Plus laws, which encourage bilingualism for non-English speakers. And a few others are legally bilingual, like Hawaii, which is native Hawaiian and English being the official languages of the state. Or they have bilingual education, like New Mexico, with Spanish and English. Now, as language diffuses, as you can imagine, there might be some conflict. All right? So we're going to take a look at some examples from around the world. We'll start with Africa and Asia and then switch to Europe and then to the Americas. And so we'll start with Nigeria. Nigeria has, according to one of the textbooks, 514 different languages that are spoken across three major language families. Those families are Afroasiatic, Nilo-Saharan, and Niger-Congo. And it also has three dominant languages in the country. There is Hausa, Igbo, and Yoruba. Now, in 1962, when Nigeria gained its independence, the government decided to adopt English as an official language, as the three major regional languages they felt were too politically charged and thus would be unsuitable for a national official language. In addition, they also moved the capital 
Another example of a forward thrust capital, but in this case, more from a cultural standpoint, they moved it to the center of the country to make sure that it wasn't in any of the regions that was especially dominant with one of the local regional languages. Now, as far as Turkey goes, until recently, Kurdish-speaking minorities in Turkey were not allowed to broadcast music or television programs in Kurdish. They were not allowed to publish books in Kurdish or even to give their children Kurdish names. But then in 2002, Turkey reformed its legal restrictions to allow the Kurdish language to be used in daily life, but not to be taught in public education. Now, shifting over to Europe, we'll start in Belgium. In the early 1990s, Belgium chose to create a federal system that gives each of its ethno-linguistic groups its own administrative region of the country. Now, there is Flanders, which is in the north, where they speak Flemish, a variant of Dutch. And in the south, there is Wallonia, where they speak French. And then in the capital, which is Brussels, it is legally bilingual, despite being located in the northern half of the country. Now, as the country progressed developmentally, the economy shifted to high technology, light industry, and services with much of the new economy concentrating in the Flemish-speaking Flanders, the north. As a result, the economic power of Belgium flipped with the French-speaking industrial south now taking a back seat to the Flemish-speaking north. Since then, Flanders has wanted to see greater federalization of the country. And there are a number of activists who still push for a division of Belgium into two countries. Now, to complicate things even further, Brussels also serves as one of the principal capitals of the European Union, a supranational organization. And with all this talk about two languages, Belgium is actually a multilingual country with German serving as the third official language, despite the fact that less than 1% of its population speaks it. Now, in France, the French government passed a law in 1975 that banned the use of foreign words in advertisements, television, and radio broadcasts, as well as official documents, unless there was no French equivalent that could be found to use. Then in 1992, France amended its constitution to make French the official language of the country. And then in 1994, the French government passed another law to stop the use of foreign words, mainly English words, in France, with a hefty fine being imposed for violators. Now, shifting to the Americas, in Canada, the influence of French colonialism has impacted Quebec where they passed several laws supporting the French language of the province. In 1993, the Quebec government passed a law requiring the use of French in advertising. Now, the law did allow for the inclusion of English or another language to be on signage, but the French letters had to be at least twice the size of the other languages' letters. Then, in the Northwest Territories, the legislature there actually declared that there would be eight official languages of that particular territory. There are six indigenous languages, as well as the two official languages of the country, which are English and French. And toponyms, which you may recall from unit number one, are the name that is given to a portion of Earth's surface. And toponyms can reflect the influence of language on the landscape. Now, most place names have two parts, the generic and the specific. For example, in American place names, some examples would include Huntsville, Harrisburg, Ohio River, Newfound Gap, and Cape Hatteras. These specific segments are Hunts, Harris, Ohio, Newfound, and Hatteras. And the generic parts, which tell what kind of place is being described, are Ville, Berg, River, Gap, and cape, respectively. Now, toponyms can also reflect regional dialects because the different American dialects also have some different toponyms that are associated with them. For example, New Englanders who speak the northern dialect often use the terms center as well as the prefixes east, west, north, and south, the directional descriptors, 
with specific names of the township as the suffix. For example, there's Randolph Center and South Randolph in Vermont. Now, this actually prompted me to look into North Las Vegas, because there's that descriptor there, to see who settled it. I wanted to see if somebody who came from New England or spoke the Northern dialect might have settled it. And the person who settled North Las Vegas was a man named Thomas Williams, who claimed about 160 acres for himself and his family upon moving to this, the, the Las Vegas Valley from Eureka, Utah. Now, Eureka is just south of Salt Lake City. And if you take a look at the map up here, it's within that blue bubble that is part of Utah, Idaho, and Wyoming. So perhaps the name North Las Vegas actually reflects the northern dialect tradition of northern Utah. And we can see other examples with the other dialects of the Americas. Um, in the Midland American dialect, we're going to see terms like gap, cove, hollow, and knob. A knob is a low rounded hill as well as the suffix burr, which the most obvious example is Pittsburgh, but there's also Stone Gap, Caddy's Cove, Stillhouse Hollow, and Bald Knob. And then with the Southern dialect, we're going to see names like Bayou, Gully, and Store to refer to like rural hamlets. That's where we would see Store. And so some examples might include Cypress Bayou, Gum Gully, and Hall's Store, which are all examples from the United States and the South. Now, a lingua franca is one of our vocabulary terms, and it's a really important vocabulary term because it influences a lot of other things. I definitely expect a multiple choice question or to see it somewhere on the exam. So make sure that you know this one. A lingua franca is a common language, a language used among speakers of different languages for the purposes of trade and commerce. Now, a lingua franca can actually vary with scale. For example, English is quickly becoming a global lingua franca due to globalization and modern communication technology. In fact, English is the most commonly used of the three working languages of the European Union and is an official language in almost 60 countries around the world, which far exceeds the number of countries that have French as an official language, which is 32, Arabic, which is 25 that have it as the official language, and Spanish, which is only 21 countries. And within those 60 countries, the populations amount to almost 2 billion people. So it's super important. In addition, English is the language of international business. Two-thirds of scientific publishing is done in English. Communication between airline pilots and air traffic controllers throughout the world. And many journalists, television shows, and movies are published or broadcast in English. Now, English isn't the only lingua franca. There are other major lingua francas that I think you should write down, like Arabic, Spanish, French, as well as Swahili, Russian, and Tagalog. And we'll talk more about those later. Now, a lingua franca can be a single language, like the ones we just listed above, or can be a mixture of two languages. More on that in a couple of minutes. But let's talk about English a little bit more as a lingua franca because English is also the lingua franca of the internet. Notice on the left hand graph that over 50% of internet content is published in English. But the right hand graph, the language of internet users quite a bit different. And as you might guess by looking at these two graphs, the dominance of English on the internet is actually diminishing. Now, while it still leads the world with 27% of internet users speaking English, it's the gap is closing with Mandarin at 24 making huge strides. Japanese is still at 8 and Spanish is only at 5, but we're starting to see some changes and it won't be long before perhaps internet content reflects some of these changes. Now, I want you to consider for, for a moment how variations in levels of development might influence the difference between content, what is created and put on the internet, versus users, those who are accessing it. Does the level of development in an area perhaps influence 
one or one or both of these perhaps and which one maybe a little bit more think about that real quick now we mentioned a moment ago that a lingua franca can be when two languages come together and the reality is in the past 400 years more than 100 new languages have been created out of the global mixing of peoples and cultures because when people speaking two or more languages come into contact with one another and they don't speak the same lingua franca, they combine parts of their languages to form a simplified version with limited vocabulary. And that is called a pidgin language. A pidgin language is a form of speech that adopts a simplified grammar and limited vocabulary of a lingua franca and is used for communications among speakers of two different languages languages. And in fact, the term pidgin comes from the Chinese pronunciation of the word business. So just like a lingua franca, pidgin languages are often used for trade and commerce, but between two people who don't speak the same native language. And it is important to note that a pidgin language has no native speakers because it's very limited in terms of communication. Now an example of a pidgin language is Fanakolo, which is a pidgin that was created in South Africa's gold mines to allow spoken communication between workers of different tribes and nationalities and between workers and the Afrikaner bosses. But since the mid-1990s, Fanakolo has been largely phased out. It's getting abandoned as workers have been increasingly schooled in English and they have a basic understanding of English because Fanakolo lacked vocabulary to describe how to operate some of the newer automated mining machines and some of the programmable winches which have warnings and sensors that are written in English. Now another example of a pidgin language is talk pisson, which is talk business and is a largely English derived pidgin that is spoken in Papua New Guinea and parts of Southeast Asia. Now, what happens if a pidgin language, which is no one's native language, continues to evolve? What you get is a Creole language. A Creole language is a language developed from a pidgin to become the native tongue of a society. In other words, it's when a pidgin language becomes someone's first language. And Creole languages acquire a more complex grammatical structure and more enhanced vocabulary. Now, the word Creole itself stems from a pidgin language, which was formed in the Caribbean from English, French, and Portuguese languages that was mixed with the languages of African slaves. And the most widely used Creole language in the Americas is still found in that same region. It's found in Haiti. Haitian Creole is derived mostly from French with influences from numerous languages of West Africa. And it is the official language of Haiti and is a source of great national pride and cultural identity. Another Creole language is Afrikaans, which is spoken in South Africa and combines Dutch with several other European and African languages. Now, it's important to note that Pidgin and Creole languages are important unifying forces in a linguistically divided world because it bridges the gap between different languages. They tend to be simple, accessible, and therefore diffuse rapidly. In Southeast Asia, a trade language called Bazaar Malay is heard from Myanmar, also known as Burma, to Indonesia, where it's actually an official language, or a version of it is official. And it's heard from the Philippines to Malaysia. And it has become a lingua franca in parts of Southeast Asia. Now, shifting gears to the other side here, we have to talk about isolated languages. Okay? Creole tends to unite. Isolated is going to be separated. Now, an isolated language, as the name kind of implies, is a language that is unrelated to any other language and therefore not attached to any language family. Perhaps the best example of an isolated language is the Basque language. That's the more common way you're probably going to hear it. It is known as Euskara, 
within the Basque region, but you'll probably just hear it referred to as the Basque language or just Basque sometimes, which survives to this day as a probable direct link to Europe's pre-agricultural era. And it's isolated in the Andorra mountain range between Spain and France. Another example is Korean. Korean is isolated from the surrounding Sino-Tibetan language family. And some linguists are making the case that Korean as a language is diverging into a North Korean and South Korean dialect due to the isolation between the North and the rest of the world. Now, an interesting example of language and language coming into existence is Esperanto. Esperanto was created as an international secondary language, an international auxiliary language. And it's been around for over 100 years. It was created in 1887. and was intended to be a neutral lingua franca that anyone potentially could learn. And it was created based on influences of Latin, English, German, Polish, and Russian so that people could speak a second language while still retaining their unique cultural identity. Now, there have been movies that were made in Esperanto, and eight Nobel laureates were Esperantists, and there are still approximately about two million speakers around the world today. Now, we've been talking about language creation, but the reality is since 1500, approximately 300 languages have ceased to be spoken by anyone. Now, since many of these languages lacked a literary tradition, that is, a written component of the language, they are truly lost. And included in that is an estimated 50 Native American languages. Now, one language that did have, and does still have, a literary tradition is Hebrew. Hebrew actually was considered an extinct language because by definition, an extinct language is one that is not used by people in daily activities. And it ceased to be used in daily activities around the 4th century BCE. But it was maintained and preserved and protected both in writing and through Jewish religious ceremonies. And that's what preserved the language. Now, fast forward to 1948, when Israel becomes a state, Hebrew was declared an official language. And now is used in daily activities. So it's no longer considered an extinct language. But most languages are not like Hebrew. In fact, of the approximately 7,000 languages that are spoken today, about half of them are endangered. Now, most of the languages that are on the verge of extinction are languages of indigenous cultures, particularly in the Americas and the Pacific which highlights their isolation from the rest of the world and the pressure to adopt culture traits of these majority populations and of these global languages. And many other languages could be endangered soon because over 90% of all languages are spoken by fewer than 100,000 people. And there are a few hundred languages that have 50 or fewer people who speak that language. And most of them are the elderly, okay? parents and grandparents. And as they die and the young don't continue that tradition, that's when we tend to see language extinction. And while I gave you some stats on the last slide about it, the, the projections can actually be even worse than what we had just said. Okay. Another estimate with regards to language extinction suggests that just 600 of the 7,000 languages that are spoken today will still be in existence by 2100. And another source says that all but 300 languages will be dead or dying by 2100. Now, to put that into context, what that means is that about every two weeks, a language disappears forever. And that's where we'll leave you tonight. Have a wonderful evening, everybody, and I'll see you back in class.